Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Today is the 28th of the 12th month on our creator's calendar, possibly the year 5922 from creation, which we're, we're still looking into. But it is also the third of the 12th month, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the 12th of the third month on the Gregorian calendar in the year 2022. Sorry about that. <clears throat> And we are continuing with our reading of and study through the recognitions of Clement today. This is chapter 26. We're, we're going to reread this chapter as we continue on. And he's going into detail, Kepha preaching to the people about the things that had happened in the past. The whole purpose of preaching in this manner for him is to give context for the cause and effect for the reason why things are how idolatry happened, the cause of these things, and who it is that we're actually having to combat against in this world and this life that we have. Just one moment. So chapter 26, this is evil Melakim or messengers, seducers. Now, therefore, since you do not yet comprehend how great darkness of ignorance surrounds you, meantime I desire to explain to you whence the worship of idols began in this world. And by idols I mean those lifeless images that you worship, whether made of wood or earthenware or stone or brass or any other metals. Of these, the beginning was in this wise. Certain messengers, or Melakim, having left the course of their proper order, began to favor the vices of men, and in some measure to lend unworthy aid to their lust, in order that by these means they might indulge their own pleasures the more, and then that they might not seem to be inclined of their own accord to unworthy services, taught men that demons could, by certain arts, that is, by magical invocations, be made to obey them. And just for context, magical invocations is what they'd call paganism or witchcraft today, and it's synonymous with ancient pagan religions of old, including what Rome would do and their Caesar was the high priest of. And so, as from a furnace and workmanship of immorality, they filled the whole world with the smoke of impiety, the light of piety being withdrawn. Ham, the first magician. For these and some other causes, a flood. Now, those first messengers that were being spoken of were the ones, the 200 that came down. It the multitude of messengers came down in the days of Yarad, right? His name, he was named after that. He will come down. And they were meant to be like the judges to teach men righteousness and to help them in right ruling and living a way pleasing to our maker. But 200 of them turned apostate and did, you know, wrong things. As Azel was specifically condemned and all sin attributed to him which was perpetually remembered by the righteous through the ages with the uh, Azazel goat, if you will. But it's the same way that all things are perpetually remembered by the righteous. The four remembrance Yamim or the four remembrance uh, Kodeshim for the beginning of the seasons instituted by Noah, perpetual for the righteous, just like the feast days and all the other things that he enjoined so that you walk out the truth. That's the whole point of it. But getting back to here, um, it says, for these and some other causes, a flood was brought upon the world. And as we have said already, and will say again, and all who were upon the earth were destroyed, except the family of Noah, who survived with his three sons and their wives. One of these, by name Ham, dishonorably discovered the magical art and handed down the instruction of it to one of his sons, 
who was called Mitzrayim, <clears throat> from whom the race of the Mitzrayim and Babylonians and Persians are descended. This is something that most people don't comprehend, but when you really look into the profane history on these accounts, you'll see that there's two mentioned as Zoroaster. The one that's called the Zoroaster of Baraktia was also who is Mitzrayim. And he had first done things in his own country. He built the Nile is something that you can learn about in his name itself. And um, it's gone over in detail in Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. <clears throat> but it's also alluded to in scripture in Ezekiel, where it talks about how Pharaoh, Pharaoh who made his rivers is like a serpent in them. But he had done some things in his own country. And then he went, they invaded into Shem's territory. And that was mentioned already when he was recounting things. But right here, that's why you had Nimrod ruling over Babylon, who was related to Mitzrayim, a son of Ham, a son of Cush. But Mitzrayim would have been father of his own children there. And then he intermixed with the peoples that became the Babylonians and the Persians. The Persians were also from Eleazar, the servant of Abraham, who was his adopted son. If you recall, it mentioned that he had had two sons before he had Yitzhak. Eleazar, his servant whom he adopted, who he said, my heir is one who's of my own house, but he's not from my own loins, right? He was a servant. And then he had Yishmael. <clears throat> but getting back on track here. The, in the profane history, Ham was also called Zoroaster, but he did hit most of his works in Babylon, which is also covered in the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop when he goes over the words and meanings of things with the names of these idols that are mentioned throughout scripture. And it's very worthwhile to look at that, but that would help all this make more, con more sense and put it in context for you if you were familiar with those personally. So it's something we can go over sometime. It says, him, the tribes who then existed called Zoroaster or Zoroaster, you know, admiring him as the first author of the magic art. Traitor, whose name also many scrolls on this subject exist. He therefore, being much and frequently intent upon the stars, and wishing to be esteemed a mighty one among them, began to draw forth, as it were, certain sparks from the stars. He, he would call lightning down from the stars, basically. Not something that seems feasible in the heliocentric model, but if you're familiar with how creation actually works and how it's described in scripture, it perfectly functions that way. And... There's actually documented evidence when lightning strikes happen, the stars flash brighter, like it's powering down from it. It's rather interesting stuff. This is, he would begin to draw forth, as it were, certain sparks from the stars and to show them to men in order that the rude and ignorant might be astonished as with a miracle. And desiring to increase this estimation of him, he attempted these things again and again until he was set on fire and consumed by the demon himself, whom he accosted with too great importunity. But the foolish men who were then, whereas they ought to have abandoned the opinion that they had conceived of him, inasmuch as they had seen it, confuted by his immortal punishment, extolled him the more for raising a sepulcher or tomb to his honor, they went so far as to adore him as a friend of Yahuwah, and one who had been removed to the sky in a chariot of lightning, and who, or sorry, and to worship him as if he were a living star. 
Hence also his name was called Zoroaster. After his death, that is, living star, by those who after one generation had been taught to speak the Greek language. In fine, by this example, even now many worship those who have been struck with lightning, honoring them with sepulchers and worshiping them as friends of Elohim. That's what Havarim is, is friends. But this man was born in the 14th generation and died in the 15th, in which the tower was built, and the languages of men were divided into many. Now, I want you to be mindful. The 15th generation was when the tower was built. Abraham was born in the 20th. The book of Yasher has him contemporary with Nimrod doing a whole bunch of stuff that is all make-believe because they were never around each other. Another witness for this, other than this book right here, you can find in the book of Yob Elim, where Nimrod's daughter marries Eber, the one who all the Hebrews are named after. And it's their children that are the ancestors of Abraham. So by a few generations. <clears throat> This is, but this man was born in the 14th generation and died in the 15th, in which the tower was built, and the languages of men were divided into many. First among them was named a certain Melech, Nimrod. The magic art having been handed down to him as by a burst, whom the Greeks also called Ninus, and from whom the city of Nineveh took its name. Thus, therefore, diverse and erratic superstitions took their beginning from the magic art. For, because it was difficult to draw away the race of man from the love of Yahuwah and to attach them to death and lifeless images, the magicians made use of higher efforts that men might be turned to erratic worship by signs among the stars and motions brought down, as it were, from the sky, and by the will of Yahuwah. And those who had been first deceived, collecting ashes of Zoroaster, or collecting the ashes of Zoroaster, who, as we have said, was burnt up by the indignation of the demon, and to whom he had been too troublesome, brought them to the Persians, that they might be preserved by them with perpetual watching as divine fire fallen from the sky and might be worshipped as a heavenly mighty one. And this fire worship from the Persians eventually culminated into, into Mithraism that was in, adopted by the Romans as the Sol Invictus there, if you can recall. <clears throat> Chapter 30, Hero Worship. Now, a lot of these names I'm not covering, but like Nimrod, Ham, Nebo, which is mentioned as a false mighty one in scripture. All these things have meaning that tie back to stuff that was going on back then, all about the Babylonian mystery religion stuff that was being set up, which was literally adopted into modern Catholicism, which is the whole point of what was being shown. It was a foreshadow of the things to come, but it culminated in the ultimate blasphemy in replacing his stuff with it, right? But hero, to get back on track, is actually also a Hebrew word. It was ha ro or the shepherd. And they would call the shepherding of men, like the heroes of old, were those like Nimrod who were mighty hunters amongst them and protecting them from uh, protecting the flocks of men from wild beasts, if you will. That's literally where the word hero came from. But hero worship. By a like example, other men in other places built temples or helikim, 
set up statues, instituted mysteries and ceremonies and zabachim or sacrifices to those whom they had admired, either for some arts or for virtue, or at least had held in very great affection and rejoiced by means of all things belonging to Elohim to hand down their fame to posterity, and that especially because, as we have already said, they scented them to be supported by some fantasies of magic art, so that by invocation of demons, something seemed to be done and moved by them towards the deception of men. To these they add also certain solemnities and drunken banquets. Now, if you remember, to have the, the Ruach of our Maker and to have the power from on high, you have to do the things that he enjoins, walk in innocence and obedience to him. Ketho goes on into more detail on that later. But the contrary is true if you want to have the magical arts from the adversary. You have to do the things that are contrary to what's true, loving, and right. Literally, every abominable sin that you can think of, everything that he disapproves is what is required to be his choice chosen ones. And that's what is an abomination to our maker. But to get back to that, that's why these things are instituted and why all those things lead to corruption for those that partake in them. This is to these, they add also certain solemnities and drunken banquets in which men might with all freedom indulge and demons conveyed into them in the chariot of bloating or overindulgence, right? Not being moderate, might be mixed with their very bowels and holding a place there might bind the acts and thoughts of men to their own will. Such errors then, having been introduced from the beginning, and having been aided by lust and drunkenness, in which carnal men chiefly delight, the obedience of Elohim, which consists in continuance and sobriety, began to become rare amongst men, and to be well nigh abolished. For whereas at first men worshipping a righteous and all-seeing Yahuwah, neither dared sin nor do injury to their neighbors, being persuaded that Yahuwah sees the actions and movements of every one. When religious worship was directed to lifeless images, concerning that they were certain that they were incapable of hearing or sight or motion, they began to sin licentiously and to go forward to every crime because they had no fear of suffering anything at the hands of those of whom they worshipped as mighty ones. Hence the madness of wars burst out, hence plunderings, rapines, captivities, and liberty reduced to slavery. Each one, as he could, satisfied his lust and his covetedness, although no power can satisfy covetedness. For as fire... The more fuel it gets, the more extensively it is kindled and strengthened. So also the madness of covetousness is made greater and more vehement by means of those things that it acquires. So begin now with better comprehension to resist yourselves in those things that you do not rightly desire. He doesn't go into too much detail here, but you can have desires from outside influences. In the Proverbs, it says that a man who has no control over his ruach or spirit is like a broken down city or an unfortified city without a wall, meaning that you're overcome by every enemy that comes upon you. It's put in a different way with the shepherd of Hermas, where he explains the two messengers or the two Ruach oath that rule over men. And he says, the messenger or the shepherd speaking to her mass says, when anger or, or lust or covetedness come upon you, know that he is in you and resist those urges because that's not from our creator, right? In medical terms, and you can look this up, 
with um, Henry Wright's book, A More Excellent Way, and also with that lady, although there's some things about her I don't really want to get into. They talk about your active cognitive thoughts or your alpha waves, the, the involuntary processes that you have no control over, your beta waves, and the thoughts from outside of you that come from other Ruach Oath, whether from Yahua or from the enemy, they actually register as theta waves. And children that have autism, for example, or other people who are communing with spirits or seeming to send messages through telepathy, they actually have theta wave brain function that happens when that happens. And that's demons or influences from unclean spirits speaking to them. That's how that actually works. But And that's also explained for another witness of these things by John Todd in his testimonies. When he goes into witchcraft, he plainly tells you that telepathy, telekinesis, ESP, and all those things are from demons. And it's not, it, that's what magic is, which is what Kef is saying right here. <clears throat> He says, so begin now with better comprehension to resist yourselves in those things that you do not rightly desire. If so, be that you can in any way repair and restore in yourselves that purity of obedience and innocence of life that at first were bestowed upon man by Yahuwah, that thereby also the expectation of the immortal Birak oath or blessings may be restored to you. And give thanks to the bountiful Father of all, by whom or by him whom he has constituted Melchishalom, or King of King of Peace, right? King of Shalom, excuse me. And the treasury of unspeakable honors. In him all the secrets of Hokma and and power dwell, right? He's He's called the treasury of unspeakable honors right here. That even at the present time, your sins may be washed away with the water of the fountain or river or even sea, living water. The threefold name of Birak Oath or blessedness being called over you, meaning it's the name of the Father and of the Son, he was given the name Yahuwah and of the Ruach, because it's the Ruach of Yahuwah. Right? The threefold name of Biraka being called over you, that by it not only evil spirits may be driven out, if any dwell in you, but also that when you have forsaken your sins, and have with entire belief and entire purity of mind believed in Yahuwah, you may drive out immoral spirits and demons from others also, and may be able to set others free from sufferings and sicknesses. For the demons themselves know and acknowledge those who have given themselves up to Yahuwah, and sometimes they are driven out by the mere presence of such, as you saw a little while ago, how when we had only addressed to you the word of salutation, straight away the demons on account of their respect for our obedience began to cry out and could not bear our presence even for little. And if you remember the last time we were reading that it happened when he first had came to the crowd when they all rushed in on him and he had introduced himself those afflicted with demons fell on his feet and begged for them to just be able to stay a while. And he said, no, be gone. And whew, they were cast away. And then those that were sick came and asked him for healing. And he said, after his speech, he would pray for them. And as soon as he said that they were all healed. So he told them to sit over on the side. And then even more were coming in, not only on account of Kepha being there, getting ready to teach others, but on account of the healings and the casting out of the demons that was taking place, all to bring in people to hear the truth, right? And that was the, um, the wonders, if you will, 
when you look at the wonders of Mitzrayim, the wonders in the Lamb of Ham, as it talks about in the Psalms and what you can see in Exodus when he goes through his, his wonders that he did. These wonders are meant to wow the people, to get them to, to get the simple hooked, right? For the fishers of men to be able to catch them for the truth. If you ever look up the word wonders in Hebrew and do a study on it throughout the original covenant writings, you'll see the theme for it there that I'm talking about. But right here, it says the weakest Yahudi, more powerful than the strongest demon, chapter 33. Is it then that we are of another and a superior nature, and that therefore the demons are afraid of us? Nay, we are of one and the same nature with you, but we differ in obedience. But if you will also be like us, we do not grudge it, but rather we exhort you and desire you to be assured that when the same belief and, in it and obedience and innocence of life will be in you, that is in us, you will have equal and the same power and virtue against demons through Yahuwah rewarding your belief or trustworthiness. For as he who has soldiers under him, although he may be inferior and they superior to him in strength, yet says to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to another, do this, and he does it. And this he is able to do, not by his own power, but by the fear of Caesar. So every trustworthy one commands the demons, although they seem to be much stronger than men. And that not by means of his own power, but by means of the power of Yahuwah who has put them in subjection. For even that which we have just spoken of, that Caesar is held in awe by all soldiers, and in every camp, and in his whole kingdom, though he is but one man, and may be feeble in respect of bodily strength, this is not affected but by the power of Yahuwah, who inspires all with fear, that they may be subject to one. This we would have you know assuredly that a demon has no power against a man unless one voluntarily submit himself to his desires. Whence even that one who is the prince of immorality approached him who, as we have said, is appointed of Yahuwah, sovereign of Shalom, tempting him and began to promise him all the kavod or esteem of the world because he knew that when he had offered this to others for the sake of deceiving them, they had worshiped him. Therefore, disobedient as he was and unmindful of himself, which is indeed, or sorry, which indeed is the special peculiarity of immorality. He presumed that he should be worshiped by him by whom he knew that he was to be destroyed. Therefore, our master, confirming the worship of one Yahuwah, answered him, It is written, You will worship Yahuwah your Elohim, and him only will you serve. And he, terrified by this answer, and fearing least... Just a moment. All right, sorry about that. Picking up again, it says, And he, terrified by this answer, and fearing lest the true obedience of the one and true Yahuwah should be restored, hastened straight away to send forth into this world false Naviaim, or foretellers, and false Shaliachim, or sent ones, Shalik, Shalikim, right? False sent ones, or emissaries, and false Morim, or teachers who should speak indeed in the name of Mishiach, but should accomplish the will of the demon. False foretellers would be those that were given the 
wrong foretellings and false miracles, right? Just like the false sent ones acting like emissaries, but they're not, or false teachers bringing in heretical doctrines. These are the Gnostics and things that were brought up contemporary to the, for, to the emissaries as they went out to preach the good news. Right? It's, and this is who he's speaking of there. It says, who should speak indeed in the name of Mishiach, but should accomplish the will of the demon. False sent ones, right? And this is very important for us today on how we should pay attention to who we should listen to and what words that we should heed in what order, right? So observe the greatest caution that you believe no teacher unless he bring from Yahushalayim the testimonial of Yaakob, Yahushua's brother, or of whosoever may come after him. For no one, unless he has gone up thither or there, and there has been approved as a fit and trustworthy teacher for preaching the word of Mashiach, unless I say he brings a testimonial thence, is by any means to be received. But let neither foreteller nor sent one be looked for by you at this time besides us. For there is one foreteller of truth, whose words we twelve sent ones preach. For he is the accepted year of Yahuwah, having us sent ones as his twelve months. Now, this is a very uh, awesome admission here because it helps to identify the pattern and the way it was set up you can see another witness to the idea that the 12 tribes were also the 12 sons of Jacob were born according to the constellations of the 12 months of the year was foretold in the book of Yobelin by his mother if I remember correctly <clears throat> in Yeshiyahu it talks about when he comes, it's, it will be the year of Yahuwah's favor. And when you look in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a scroll called the coming of Melchizedek. And it talks about that. It quotes that verse, but it says the year of Melchizedek's favor, which we know Melchizedek is our Mashiach. So this is another witness to that being true. He came and when he started his ministry, it was the Yobel, the, the year of release, where he was releasing the captives and healing the sick and raising the dead and opening the eyes of the blind, right? And that was the year of Yahuwah or Yahuwah Melchizedek's favor. This is for there is one true foreteller whose words we 12 sent ones preach. For he is the accepted year of Yahuwah, having us his sent ones as his 12 months. But for what reason the world itself was made or what diversities have occurred in it and why our master having come for its restoration has chosen and sent us 12 sent ones will be explained more at length at another time. Meantime, he has commanded us to go forth to preach and to invite you to the supper of the Shamayim sovereign, which father has prepared for the marriage of his son, and that we should give you wedding garments, that is, the favor of mikvah, or immersion, which whosoever obtains as a spotless robe with which he is to enter to the supper of the king ought to beware that it be not in any part of it stained with sin, and so he be rejected as unworthy and reprobate. Meaning that after you become a believer and you're immersed, you can fall away if you're not careful with what you do. Because if you recall, we have liberty of will. <clears throat> this is a very important section on what can actually cause you to lose your deliverance after immersion. The garments unspotted. But the ways in which this garment may be spotted are these. If anyone withdraw from Yahuwah the Father and creator of all, receiving another teacher besides or apart from Mashiach, who alone is the trustworthy and true foreteller, 
and who has sent us twelve sent ones to preach the word. If anyone think otherwise than worthily of this substance of Yahuwah, which excels all things. These are the things that even fatally pollute the armor of immersion. Right? So to have unworthy thoughts of, of the Almighty, or to have another teacher apart from Mashiach. That, that's, that's a very, 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 very powerful thing to think on because a lot of people will hold to other things than who he sent to teach us stuff. What he said himself and the sent ones that he sent out, that is the chain of command that we have to follow. And if you recall, or for those that aren't aware of it, in the apostolic constitutions, they enumerate the overseers that they ordained and set up the assemblies throughout wherever they went by name in there. And they say, these are the ones you have to listen to. Just as we were told that we had to be listened to from the Mashiach. So it was the, the handing down of the truth in that capacity. Some of those that are mentioned by name are Clement, Ignatius of Antioch, who was a martyr, right? Um, I don't know if Polycarp is mentioned. I have to check again. But Maro and the other gentlemen that are in this book that, that Kepha sets up are also mentioned in there. So it's another witness for these things. Aquila and Nesita as well. <clears throat> but to continue real quick, it says, but the things that pollute it in actions are these so what can pollute your immersion in thought are those two and then the actions that you can do that can ruin your immersion are murders adulteries hatreds erevis which is greed right and evil ambition and the things that pollute at once the inner or the ruach which probably the inner being and the body are these to partake of the table of demons that is to taste things sacrificed or blood because it's prohibited and it's a death sentence, if you recall, or a carcass that is strangled. And if there be aught else that has been offered to demons, be this therefore the first step to you of three, which step brings forth 30 commands and the second 60 and the third hundred, as we will expound more fully to you at another time. So you see, he gives the basics that you have to do to be pleasing to your maker, just like it was enjoined for the nations that were turning to him. But then there's more that will be learned as you go. That was the whole point. The immediate ceasing of what pollutes the dwelling place of our creator so that he can be pleased and dwell with you. And then learning the truth as you go. Now that should give more context for why that was, right? The Kahal or congregation dismissed. Can I say something real quick before you go on? On yes. the unworthy thoughts toward our maker, is that is would that be the blaspheming that's the unforgivable blasphemy? Attributing the, his works to the adversary is certainly unworthy thoughts, but also to like what Simon was doing earlier when he was saying that he was weak or ineffectual or that these things that he was doing was evil, that those kind of things are what he's talking about. To have thoughts like that of him or to go to some other for teaching, like he's holding to things contrary to the word and what our Mashiach said, Simon the magician is. And because of that, and because of the things he said, he fatally polluted the immersion that he had received. If you recall, he was, he became a believer in the book of Acts. He was immersed and he followed along with them, but he had turned from that because of these very things. And so he's warning these people as he's preaching about the things that he's learned that you have to be mindful of. All right. Thank you. Certainly. So it says when he had thus spoken, and had charged them to come to the same place in a good time on the following day, he dismissed the crowds. And when they were unwilling to depart, 
Kepha said to them, Do me this favor on account of the fatigue of yesterday's journey, and now go away and meet me in good time tomorrow. And so they departed with joy. But Kepha, commanding me to withdraw a little for their purpose of prayer, afterwards ordered the couches to be spread in the part of the garden that was covered with shade. And everyone, according to custom, recognizing the place of his own rank, we took food. This is important because he mentions this in his epistle, Clement to the Corinthians, talking about each in their appointed place and rank in the body of Mashiach. <clears throat> in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the community rule and the Damascus document, they would every year go in in order rank of file with the, the Kohanim first then the sons of Louis, then the children of Israel, and then the converts that joined them, each in rank in order according to the dignity of their, their family and their tribe, their position, and then according to their intelligence or the chokmah that was in them. So it, it was conditional on that. And every year, the guardian of the, the guardian of these, um, they had it set up where they had these different strongholds in the wilderness where believers would congregate. And there was a guardian of each one that would keep them. And he would watch over and he would also look to the, the wisdom of each, each year. He would check and gauge where they were at in the belief and they would be appointed their place accordingly to the intelligence in them, whether or not they were staying studious in the word and growing or not. Right. But it's all they did was, I mean, you'd have to read it. The community rule in the Dead Sea Scrolls was a foreshadow of the things that would come later on, but also foreshadowing what would be in the future. It was a type and shadow of what would, what we, exactly what you see in the apostolic constitutions. The only difference is after our Mashiach came and died, the added bonds were no longer necessarily required. They don't have to do animal sacrifices. You don't have to do the washings and purgations to be clean. Uh, you can touch a pig's dead body without having to, to go through a ritual. You can bury your dead without having to go through a ritual. It's something that was established because of transgression to teach them righteousness in simple childlike terms, if you can see it. But that's for another time. Right here, though, the important thing is everyone recognizing his own place and rank. So everyone, according to their position in the body, was at shalom with one another, right? And then they took food. It says, then, as there was still some portion of the day left, he conversed with us concerning Yahuwah's miracles. And when evening was come, he entered his bedroom and went to sleep. These are things that we should be doing with our time too when, we're, when we have our, the ability to do so. <clears throat> And then the next part would be the book five. So it would be starting on the next section here. I'm just going to pause for a moment. So this is book five, chapter one, Kepha's salutation. Yet on the following day, Kepha rising a little earlier than usual, found us asleep. And when he saw it, he gave orders that silence should be kept for him, as though he himself desired to sleep longer that we might not be disturbed in our rest. But when we rose refreshed with sleep, we found him having finished his prayer, right? Waiting for us in his bedroom. And as it was already dawn, so you see he was praying at dawn. This is a theme that you'll see throughout. And it's something that's enjoined for believers in the apostolic constitution. You can see evidence of it in scripture, when they came to the time of incense and prayer for Zakar Yahu, for example, where believers would, or the believers in Yarushalayim who felt inclined would go to do so along with the Kohanim. And then that's the very thing that's enjoined for them. You also see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have examples of morning and evening prayers and things like that that the, that the Luiim would do, and also the songs that they would sing, which are rather interesting but we only have fragments of them anymore. 
However, he says, as it was already dawn, he addressed us shortly, saluting us according to his custom, and forthwith proceeded to the usual place for the purpose of teaching. And when he saw that many had assembled there, having invoked shalom upon them, according to his usual manner, he began to speak as follows. Elohim, the creator of all, at the beginning made man after his own image, and gave him dominion over the earth and sea, and over the air, as the foreteller of truth has told us, and as the very reason of things instructs us. And this is what our constitution and our founding documents affirm, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. We are given dominion, and it's the people collectively that are sovereign. That is exactly how our, our country was founded under the principles that are in scripture. But um, in the contrast to that, when you forsake the dominion he's given you and you yield it up to the enemy, it, it culminates into the one he chose. And that's why you have the little horns known as the overseer of the Roman assembly, um, uh, what they call the papacy there. They claim to have full ownership of all land, air, and sea and the souls of men, right? In the very same fashion as a usurper of all that is called Elohim and that is worshipped, just like it's written. It says, for man alone is rational, and it is fitting that reason should rule over the irrational. At first, therefore, while he was still righteous, he was superior to all disorders and all frailty. But when he sinned, as we taught you yesterday, and became a servant of sin, he became at the same time liable to frailty. This, therefore, is written that men may know that as by disobedience they have been made liable to suffer, so by obedience they, be made, they may be made free from suffering, and not only free from suffering, but by even a little belief in Elohim, be able to cure the sufferings of others. For thus the foreteller of truth promised us, saying, Amen, I say to you, that if you have belief as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence, and it will remove. Of this saying, you have yourselves also had proofs, for you saw yesterday how at our presence the demons removed and were put to flight with those sufferings that they had brought upon men. Whereas, therefore, some men suffer and others cure those who suffer, <clears throat> it is necessary to know the cause at once of the suffering and the cure. And this is proved to be nothing else than unbelief on the part of the sufferers and belief on the part of those who cure them. That word is amuna. It means belief, trust, faith or trustworthiness, faithfulness. It's the same word for the, with that meaning. So to have belief is to be trustworthy. It's, it's synonymous. All right. For unbelief, while it does not believe that there is to be a judgment by Elohim, affords license to sin. And sin makes men liable to sufferings. But belief believing that there is to be a judgment of Elohim, restrains men from sin. And those who do not sin are not only free from demons and sufferings, but, also put, or, but can also put to flight the demons and sufferings of others. From all these things, therefore, it is concluded that all evil springs from ignorance, and ignorance herself, the mother of all evils, is sprung from carelessness and sloth, and is nourished and increased and rooted in the senses of men by negligence. 
And if anyone teach that she is to be put to flight, she is with difficulty and indignantly torn away, as from an ancient and hereditary abode. And therefore we must labor for a little, that we may search out the presumptions of ignorance, the, the things that we hold to without proving them. Okay? And cut them off by means of knowledge, especially in those who are preoccupied with some erroneous opinions, by means of which ignorance is the more firmly rooted in them. And this is always the case when someone's holding to a wrong opinion. It's going to have things contrary to what's true. Okay? As under the appearance of a certain kind of knowledge, for nothing is worse than for one to believe that he knows what he is ignorant of, and to maintain that to be true, that is false. This is as if a drunken man should think himself to be sober, and should act indeed in all respects as a drunken man, and yet think himself to be sober and should desire to be called so by others. Thus, therefore, are those also who do not know what is true, yet hold some appearance of knowledge, and do many evil things as if they were good, and hasten destruction as if it were to deliverance. So we must, above all things, hasten to the knowledge of the truth, which is in the word, which is Yahushua, right? That as with a light kindled thereat, we may be able to dispel the darkness of errors, for ignorance, as we have said, is a great evil, but because it has no substance, it is easily dispelled by those who are in earnest. For ignorance is nothing else than not knowing what is good for us. Once this is known, ignorance perishes. Therefore, the knowledge of truth ought to be eagerly sought after, and no one can confer it except the true foreteller. Now, this says Nabia or Nabia Emmet, and you'll find <clears throat> the, if you ever study Hebrew, you go to learn to read it in the classical or what they call biblical Hebrew, it's flipped around from what we have in English for the verbs. They'll put their predicate verbs at, afterwards and their preceding verbs beforehand, and it's opposite from what you do in English. That's why I say true foreteller, because of the way they do that. It doesn't matter if you said foreteller of truth. It means the same thing. But the correct way of doing it would be true foreteller. And there's no filler word between them. <clears throat> it says, for this and, or sorry, for this is the gate of life, meaning the true foreteller. To those who will enter and the road of good works to those going to the city of deliverance. Free will, chapter five, or sorry, chapter six, book five. Whether anyone truly hearing the word of the true foreteller, Yahushua, is willing or unwilling to receive it and to embrace his burden, that is, the precepts of life, he has either in his power for we are free in will. For if it were so that those who hear had it not in their power to do otherwise than as they heard or as they had heard, there were some power of nature in virtue of which it were not free to him to pass over to another opinion. Or again, sorry, or if again, no one of the hearers could at all receive it. This also were a power of nature that should compel the doing of some one thing and should leave no place for the other course. But now, since it is free for the mind to turn its judgment to which side it pleases and to choose the way that it approves, it is clearly obvious that there is in men a liberty of choice. Therefore, before anyone hears what is good for him or tobe for him, it is certain that he is ignorant. 
and being ignorant, he des wishes and desires to do what is not good for him. Therefore, he is not judged for that. But when once he has heard the causes of his error and has received the method of truth, meaning after the word of truth has come, then if he remain in those errors with which he had been long ago preoccupied, he will rightly be called into judgment to suffer punishment because he has spent in the sport of errors that portion of life that was given to him to be spent in living well. But he who, hearing those things, willingly receives them and is thankful that the teaching of good things has been brought to him, inquires more eagerly and does not cease to learn until he ascertains whether there be truly another world, what they call the age to come, right? In which rewards are prepared for the good. And when he is assured of this, he gives thanks to Yahuwah because he has shown him the light of truth and for the future directs his actions in all good works for which he is assured that there is a reward prepared in the world to come while he constantly wonders and is astonished at the errors of other men and that no one sees the truth that is placed before his eyes. Yet he himself rejoicing in the riches of wisdom or hokma that he has found desires insatiably to enjoy them and is delighted with the practice of good works, hastening to obtain with a clean heart and a pure conscience the world to come when he will be able even to see Elohim, the Melech or sovereign of all. But the sole cause of our wanting and being deprived of all these things is ignorance. For while men do not know how much good there is in knowledge, they do not suffer the evil of ignorance to be removed from them. For they know not how great a difference is involved in the change of one of these things for the other. So I counsel every learner willingly to lend his ear to the word of Yahuwah and to hear with love of the truth what we say, that his mind receiving the best seed may bring forth joyful fruits by good deeds. For if, while I teach the things that pertain to deliverance, anyone refuses to receive them and strives to resist them with a mind occupied by evil opinions, he will have the cause of his perishing not from us, but from himself. For it is his duty to examine with righteous judgment the things that we say and to comprehend that we speak the words of truth, that knowing how things are and directing his life in good actions, he may be found a partaker of the Malkuth Shemaim, or what they call the kingdom of the heavens, right? The, the kingdom of the Shemaim. Subjecting to himself the desires of the flesh and becoming master of them, that so at length he himself also may become the pleasant possession or a sagula of the ruler of all. For he who persists in evil and is a servant of evil cannot be made a portion of good so long as he persists in evil. Because from the beginning, as we have said, Elohim instituted two tribes and has given to each man the power of becoming a portion of that Malkuth or kingdom to which he will yield himself to obey. And since it is decreed by Elohim that no one or no one man can be a servant of both kingdoms, therefore endeavor with all earnestness to commit yourselves to the covenant and Torah of the Tob Melech or good king. So also the true foreteller when he was present with us and saw some rich men negligent with respect to the worship of Elohim, thus unfolded the truth of this matter. No one, said he, can serve two masters. You cannot serve Elohim and mammon, calling riches in the language of his country, mammon. 
He, therefore, is the true foreteller who appeared to us, as you have heard, in Yahuda, who, standing in public places by a simple command, made blind or made the blind see, the deaf hear, cast out demons, restored health to the sick, and life to the dead. And since nothing was impossible to him, he even perceived the thoughts of men, which is possible for none but Elohim only. He proclaimed the Malkuth of Elohim, and we believed him as a true foreteller in all that he spoke, deriving the confirmation of our belief, not only from his words, but also from his works, and also because of the sayings of the Torah which many generations before had set forth his coming, were fulfilled in him and the figures of the doings of Moshe and of the patriarch Yaakov before him bore in all respects a type of him. This is something that I talked about before, where you see figures of things. This is more alluding to the types directly pointing out our Mashiach, and you can find it in Yahushua and in Dawid as well. But you have the figures of the patriarchs also foreshadowing things that their children would walk out in the future as well, right? in addition to this type of figure. And you see both of these explained by the, the taught ones of the emissaries, Irenaeus and others, in the course of their writings. It says, it is evident also that the time of his advent, that is, the very time at which he came, was foretold by them. Meaning, a, a ruler, the scepter shall not pass from Yahuda nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiola, or the sent one, comes. And to him is the obedience of the nations. That was foretold. And... It's talked about later on in the recognitions as the proof that it was the coming of our Mashiach. Because while the Maccabees were of the line of Yah, um, Louis predominantly, all the sons of the Kohanim, all of the sons of Aaron, were of the tribe of Yahuda. Because Aaron married Nahash's daughter, who was the leader of the tribe of Yahuda in the wilderness. Um, and that gave legitimacy for them reigning as sons of Yahuda through their, the mother. That very proof has happened with Tate Taffy when she was taken by Yirmi Yahu to Ireland, and they married the son of Zera of Yahuda that was there and founded the kingdom of Ulster in Northern Ireland. Her children were of the seed of David or Dawid through her. And when they married their daughters to other sovereigns, even of the sons of Louis, they still reigned as the seed of David with that very hereditary passing down. And that is how all, by the way, all the people that were president in this country are related and of the seed of David. Not all of them are directly from the sons of Yahuda. James Madison had I happily group DNA, for example, which is of the sons of Louis. The sons of Yahuda would be R1B, which is all the monarchs of the world and most of the presidents. But they can be hereditary through the, the, the marriage, through the woman also, which you can see in, I believe it's Judges, or it, sorry, it could be Yahushua, when the daughters of Menashe, uh, the daughters of Machir, the son of Menashe, didn't have a male heir, and they inherited a portion that was passed down to their children. But moving back, getting back to the point here, it says, and he came, it was foretold by them, and above all, it was contained in the set-apart writings that he was to be waited for by the nations, and all these things were equally fulfilled in him. And this is an interesting connection that proves his coming as well. It says, yet he whom the foreteller of the Yahudim foretold that he was to be waited for by the nations confirms above measure the truth of belief in him. For if he had said that he was to be waited for by the Yahudim, he would not have seemed to foretell anything extraordinary. That 
he who's coming had been promised to the deliverance of the world should be the object of hope or expectation to the people of the same tribe with himself and to his own tribe. For that this would take place would seem rather to be a matter of natural inference than one requiring the grandeur of a foretold utterance. But now, whereas the foretellers say that all that expectation that is set forth concerning the deliverance of the world and the newness of the Malkuth, or kingdom, that is to be established by Mashiach, and all things that are declared concerning him, are to be transferred to the nations. The grandeur of the foretelling or the foretold office is confirmed, not according to the sequence of things, but by an incredible fulfillment of the foretelling. For the Yahudim from the beginning had comprehended by a most certain tradition that this man should at some time come, by whom all things should be restored and daily meditating and looking out for his coming. When they saw him amongst them and accomplishing the signs and miracles, as had been written of him, being blinded with envy, they could not recognize him when present, in the hope of whom they rejoiced while he was absent. Yet the few of us who were chosen by him comprehended it. But this was all accomplished by Yahuwah's providence, that knowledge of this good one should be handed over to the nations and those who had never heard of him, nor had learned from the foretellers, should acknowledge him, while those who had acknowledged him in their daily meditations should not know him. For behold, by you who are now present, who desire to hear the doctrine of his belief and to know what and how, and of what sort is his coming, the foretold truth is fulfilled. For this is what the foreteller foretold, that he is to be sought for by you who never heard of him. And therefore, seeing that the foretold sayings are fulfilled even in yourselves, you rightly believe in him alone, and you rightly wait for him. You rightly inquire concerning him that you may not only wait for him, but also believing you may obtain the inheritance of his kingdom, according to what he himself said, that everyone is made a servant of him to whom he yields subjection. So awake and take to yourselves our master and Elohim, even that master who is Yahuwah, both of Shemaim and land, and conform yourselves to his image and likeness, as the true foreteller himself teaches, saying, You all be merciful, as also your Shemaim father is merciful, who makes his son to rise upon the good and the evil, and reigns upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Imitate him, therefore, and fear him, as the commandment is given to men, you will worship Yahuwah your Elohim, and him only will you serve. For it is profitable to you to serve this master alone, that through him, knowing the one Elohim, you may be freed from the many whom you vainly feared. For he who fears not Elohim, the creator of all, but fears those whom he himself with his own hands has made, what does he do but make himself subject to a vain and senseless fear and render himself more vile and abject than those very things, the fear of which he has conceived in his mind? But rather by the goodness of him who invites you, return to your former nobleness and by good deeds show that you bear the image of your creator that by contemplation of his likeness you may be believed to be even his sons. Begin, therefore, to cast out of your minds the vain ideas of idols and your useless and empty fears, that at the same time you may also escape the condition of unrighteous bondage. For those who have become your masters who could not even have been profitable servants to you, for how should lifeless images seem fit even to serve you when they can neither hear nor see 
nor feel anything. Yea, even the material of which they are made, whether it be gold or silver or even brass or wood, though it might have been profited you for necessary uses, you have rendered wholly inefficient and useless by fashioning Elohim out of it. We therefore declare to you the true worship of Elohim, and at the same time warn and exhort the worshipers that by good deeds they imitate him whom they worship, and hasten to return to his image and likeness. As we said before. Sorry, and it says that by good deeds they imitate him whom they worship and hasten to return to his image and likeness, as we said before. And chapter 15 folly of idolatry it says yet i should like if those who were so this is chapter 15 the folly of idolatry it says yet i should like if those who worship idols would tell me if they desire to become like those whom they worship does any one of you wish to see in such sort as they see or to hear after the manner of their hearing, or to have such comprehension as they have. Far be this from any of my hearers. For this were rather to be thought a curse and a reproach to a man who bears in himself the image of Elohim, although he has lost the likeness. What sort of Elohim then are they to be reckoned the imitation of whom would be disgusting to their worshipers, and to have whose likeness would be a reproach. What then? Melt your useless images and make useful vessels. Melt the unserviceable and inactive metal, and make implements fit for the use of men. But, says one, man's laws do not allow us. He says, well, for it is man's laws and not their own power, that prevents it. What kind of Elohim then are those that are defended by man's laws and not by their own energies? And so also they are preserved from thieves and by watchdogs and the protection and the protection of bolts, <clears throat> at least if they be of silver or gold, or even of brass. For those that are of stone and earthenware are, protect, are protected by their own worthlessness. For no one will steal stone or cockery Elohim or mighty ones. Hence those seem to be the more miserable whose more precious metal exposes them to the greater danger. Since then they can be stolen since they must be guarded by men since they can be melted and weighed out and forged with hammers, ought men possessed of comprehension to hold them as mighty ones? Oh, into what wretched plight the imagination of men has fallen. For if it is reckoned the greatest folly to fear the dead, what will we judge of those who fear something that is worse than the dead are? For those images are not even to be reckoned among the number of the dead, because they were never alive. Even the sepulchres of the dead are preferable to them, since although they are now dead, yet they once had life. But those whom you worship never possessed even such base life as in all, the life of frogs and owls. But why say more about them, since it is enough to say to him who adores them, do you not see that he whom you adore sees not? Hear that he whom you adore hears not, and comprehend that he comprehends not. For he is the work of man's hand, and necessarily is void of comprehension. You therefore worship an Elohim without sense, Whereas everyone who has sense believes that not even those things are to be worshipped that have been made by the true Elohim and have sense, such as the sun, moon, and stars, and all things that are in the sky and upon earth. For they think that reasonable, or sorry, sorry, for they think it reasonable 
that not those things that have been made for the service of the world, but the creator of those things themselves and of the whole world should be worshipped. For even those things rejoice when he is adored and worshipped, and do not take it well that the honor of the creator should be bestowed on the creation. For the worship of Elohim alone is acceptable, who alone is uncreated, and all things also are his creation. For as it belongs to him who alone is uncreated to be Yahuwah, which his name means he who causes it to be. So everything that has been created is not truly Elohim, which is why it calls the Father the only true Elohim, because Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach was the firstborn of creation. But thank you for your time. We will continue with this next section, which goes on to a long part about the suggestions of the old serpent when we continue. You all have a wonderful Shabbat and uh, Shabbat Tov. We will see you next week.